So we're going to talk about append only data patterns. And that is really a case where when we update data in a database, we don't actually update a record, we create a new record. And the last record represents the data. And one of the problems with that a lot of times people haven't done it before. Uh, you don't really think of it that way in a relation database because you don't actually have a document. You don't actually have an entire piece of data because it's all fully normalized. And so you end up with a lot of tables. Um, the other reason people don't do it is because of storage, but you can actually fix that with uh, domains or mini domains or you know isolated subgraphs. So in this case, we're going to talk about append only data patterns and using high speed key value databases. And typically those are uh, the kind that you end up, uh, you can do queries and stuff on them, but typically you end up wanting to have your partition key in there anyway, blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about it a little bit and what is an append only pattern and why would we use it? Or really what are the drivers for this? And so I'm going to talk about assumptions and drivers, right? And in this case, I'm going to assume we have some moderately complicated data and that it's not, you know, just a row. If it's a row, you know what? Go right at it. Use like a Cassandra or use something else. But if you had some hierarchical document, um, then we might have some kind of complex data. And so this is, in my case, this is going to be semi-structured data. Basically, it's going to be JSON. It actually has a schema, so we might version that. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, what I'm going to assume is that uh, we're operating not on, you know, like owned hardware, that this is basically a cloud store somewhere, and they have their own characteristics, why this thing might be interesting way to do this. And in some cases, it might be necessary to get certain features to work the way you want. Uh, we're going to replicate. I'm assuming that the part of the reason we're going to do this is we use this in an operational store. We're talking about an append only store as an operational store. But if you think about the way a data lake works or a data warehouse, typically they are append only also. So what we're going to do is we're going to line up the primary data store a little bit with the way it's going to lay out in the lake. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit how we might materialize that operational database so that it can be used more easily. But basically, in this case, we're going to assume we're going to replicate this to the lake uh, that deletes are rare, that we're basically going to append. And actually, in some of the databases, the right way to do this is a soft delete that you then go and compact. Uh, that's what you would do it in a data lake. And that might be the way we do it in our key value store. We'll have to think about it. Uh, we're going to retain all the raw data in case we have data errors. So in this case, uh, we may actually do multi-stream into that data store as append. Like if we were doing an event store, right, that would be an append only store. So, uh, and the thing about events though, is they just represent a point in time. Whereas this append only store I'm going to talk about, we actually has the entire document, not just what was in the individual event. So if I updated the last name on a person in an event database, that would be just the last name in an event. And in my database, it's going to be the person's whole name and a bunch of other information. Uh, we're going to shape the data in a way that the CDC generates usable event streams. And that's where if we do an append, right, we get a whole record every time in the CDC, there's no assembly to be done. Um, and then we're going to reduce uh, the failure points in this um, by using the database for more than one thing. So, uh, you know, in some cases, we might use an eventing system. But if we're really going to create like uh, tracing events or business events or something like that, depending on what the latency looks like, I, I'm the primary store for those may not be a messaging system, right? I can actually put that in an append only mode in a database and then use the backside streaming on that uh, to pick up those changes and then route those into a messaging system. So it's an interesting problem. There's an overlap now between highly scalable cloud databases and messaging systems. So some of the criteria that we're going to use for making some of these decisions, I want to claim disk is cheap, relatively speaking. And so if we have redundant data, redundant copies of that data, I'm not sure I care anymore, as long as it's not ridiculous. Uh, and we're going to pick the lightest weight, most reliable option. So like I said, in some cases, we might actually put events in a database that has a streaming uh, messaging coming out the back. And in that case, my system only needs to talk to the database twice, once for the data and once for the events. That might be cool because then I have fewer things to manage for downtime and deciding if the app's really up, removing dependencies. We're going to separate the producer and consumer driven schemas. So the way the data goes into the system may not be the way it's consumed. Um, where in a relational database, typically you put the data in and exactly how it's going to be consumed. And in this case, we might take a different approach and we're okay with materialized view for consumption. You'll see that in a CQRS pattern, which I'll talk about later. But basically the idea is we store data in this append only database. And if we need some kind of inverted index or different, um, partition keys or something else, uh, that we're okay with that eventually consistent. 
and we're going to say, um, I'm just going to say, you know, this is like, it should be noticeable to everybody. Synchronous APIs are good for immediate behavior. And if we don't care about the immediate behavior, then asynchronous delays are good. All right. And that's what I was trying to get to here. API and event mutations are equivalent. So a lot of times, or sometimes I've seen it where we'll do an async and synchronous API piece, and then we'll do an asynchronous update. And the asynchronous updates just come in through the synchronous updates, right? Uh, so, and if you think about it, one of the interesting things about events, the people, right, people really like them, is if you have to, you could replay, like, oh, we had the wrong business logic. We're going to materialize this differently. Well, if we record API call data, we might, and put, because we have unlimited storage, sort of, which is like the messaging storage, then in theory, we could replay those also. And I'm going to say that every record in both of these describes a change request. So an API call, those, I'm going to, where if we're doing REST, those posts would all be change requests. And the same thing with any async event we pick is a change request, or it's a notification that'll result in a request. So in CQRS, um, we create uh, basically the event stream in their current format. So that would be like person changed last name, person changed first name, person opened a bank account, right? Those would actually go into event store and the event processor would pick that up out of the event store and query materializers would be applied to that and those would be put into a query store. So in that case, you have a producer schema in the event store and you have a consumer schema in the query store and the two and paths in one to put the data in and one to get the data actually operate against different stores. So we're going to pick something kind of similar for that, for this append only document store. Um, what I'm going to say is we're going to pull in those events, uh, whether they're API calls or events, we're going to drop those in the event store, but we're not going to just um, leave them in the event store and transition them from the uh, store on an asynchronous basis, right? In the previous one, we had two databases, so there was a delay. In this case, what we're going to do is we're just going to do a get doc, modify, create a new doc by merging those two together. We're going to put them in the data store. And so the primary data store, we have an event store, but the pro data is synchronously posted into the primary store, um, which is the query store, right? And then if we need additional views in that data, we're going to do query materialization. And so this kind of looks like what you would have if you had a relational database, because in that case, you would just update the rows in the database, or if you had a document database and you update it, it's just document databases and updates don't always work that well. And so we're going to go this route where we're going to create a new document every time. So if we talk about some of the things that are interesting about cloud value stores, uh, they're great at point retrieval. And that's why we sometimes end up doing materialized, um, different materializations with different partition keys. Um, and they're nice because they can be used as, as document stores, so they can put hierarchical complex documents in. We still may do some denormalization, which is totally out of scope of this talk. Uh, they go to cloud scale. So this is actually pretty cool. Um, a, a lot of certain kinds of databases only can scale up. They can't scale out, but cloud databases are built to scale out, kind of like a data lake. Um, this gives, just gives us better semantics about how that operates than we got in our data lake with our Parquet and our Blob Store. And, what we're going to, what these can do is they, they're basically optimized around key retrieval and partition keys. Uh, that was supposed to be schemas. I keep forgetting to change that partition keys and schemas. Um, and so you may end up with different schemas, which are basically different document styles in different places for different queries. They're going to be optimized for your query patterns may, maybe, or you may decide to move some of those query patterns off the operational store and into your analytical store. And then that's a different problem. Um, and the number of partitions, you end up with actually ties to the throughput. So, you, uh, you know, the thing about key, these cloud key value stores is you really got to pay attention to where your partition keys are for some of them and figure out how you, where, what they should be, the which attributes those should be. And so that will dramatically affect throughput because if you're, all your queries are hitting all the partitions, um, you end up with a really expensive set of queries. But if your partitions can be, your queries can be limited to a couple partitions, then the rest of your database can be handling other queries independently. Um, and they kind of have weak update semantics, like doing uh, in-place updates of the documents is not always that interesting. Um, actually, some of them you can only replace the document. So we're really looking at append or replace. There are a few updates. They just don't work that well. And some of the databases actually have limits on the number of in-document updates. So typically what a lot of times you'll do is you'll read a document, update it, write the document back out, overwriting it. Um, and like I said before, many times we may alter, uh, materialize alternative containers with different partition keys. So we're just going to talk. Uh, one of the things I think is really cool is, and I'm, this is an Amazon DynamoDB and Cosmos DB. Both of them have a lot of documentation. 
about the fact that they have uh, streaming changes. They have basically have changed data capture data streams that capture all the changes in the database. And the interesting thing about the way we're doing this with this append only store is every change that comes out in the stream represents the new version of the document. So our plan is to leverage the change feed for replication. We're going to leverage the change feed for uh, basically as a kind of streaming platform. And we're going to do change feed driven triggers and actions. So if we need to do materializing, materializing, materializing or other things, uh, we're going to use that stream. This is actually part of the reason we really want to do this, right? And it's part of the reason people do um, soft deletes, right? Because you can actually end up with a record in the change feed that's soft delete and you know exactly what it is um, because it's basically the entire record with a soft delete on it, right? And so this makes it where you don't have to do um, crazy CDC on a million tables. So like I said, we partially optimize the schema for this by making it great for this change feed that's built in. And then in this case, I've got lambdas on Dynamo and Azure Functions on Cosmos. So the design parameters really for what we're doing is, you know, we, we're going to pick the most reliable storage approach we can do, the best reliable replication. We're not going to trade off for performance, but we need reliable. We want reliable notifications. And I'll talk about that's a case there where if we can cut down the number of moving parts, then we have fewer uh, SLAs to deal with to figure out if something's going to work. And we're going to leverage the native features wherever possible. And you can see here the little picture we're using the change feed rather than doing like some trigger to an external function or God forbid, like we did in Oracle years ago, they did triggers calling Java code inside the database, making the database be the app server. Oh, everybody got dirty on that one. And these are highly scaled. We need this thing to be highly scalable with zero day loss. And the cloud databases do a really good job of spreading the risk around and making it where we have redundant copies of the data and, and possibly in redundant regions, different parts of the world. Um, query optimization is okay. We can cover alt because we're going to cover alternate use cases via views. Uh, so we're going to use a weaker querying database, a weaker a database that performs weaker for certain types of queries. And we may optimize the data for that, creating producer driven schemas for that. And the data that's being denormalized is fine. That's actually a document thing. We're not going to worry about it. There will be some normalization. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it in this talk, discuss it in this talk. And then, uh, you know, our goal here is to do as simple transactions as possible. So if we could do everything in a single uh, collection in Cosmos, you know, or basically a document, that means we only got to do one update. That would be awesome. So we're going to design in reliability by reducing the number of dependencies. So I'm um, just looking at these here on the left hand side. We have an API that streams events, save data in Cosmos, and it has a change feed. And we may be using those events for notifying other systems of changes. That's cool, but we just add, and there's actually a piece missing here. We would need a function to put that in the data lake. But the problem is we actually added a second component, which is this messaging, which has its own provisioning, monitoring, reliability, and other kinds of use case issues. So in this case, what we might propose is that the technical and business events would actually be stored in their own tables or collections. And we would use those change feeds that exist as the kind of a subsystem messaging subsystem for that. And there are cases where this won't work, but there are a lot of cases where it will. And I will fix this picture for the website. Oh, more work to do. So the goal here is reduce the number of dependencies, the number of components. If we only have one data style for publishing and the cognitive load for developers is less, the troubleshooting load is less. And if the database is considered more reliable than any other service, then by putting the database, single database in here for this, we actually increase the uptime of this because we don't have to multiply in the uptime of another service like a messaging service. Our goal here is to stay native, cloud native for everything. So we are going to pick an approach that may not work on prem, may not work on our desktop uh, for parts of it, although some of these have emulators that work. And if possible, we're going to reuse components. So. I'm going to talk now about creating a new record for each update. Remember, this is sort of like a version. I'll have a CQS walkthrough in a minute. Um, the API receives a re mutation request and it reads the existing document. We apply the changes to that document. We create a new document. We save that document. And then what happens is that goes into the change feed and that change feed then has a way to be saved to a date to a, like a reporting database or the data lake. I left that box out because it made it cluttered. Um, and then we're going to materialize potentially 
trigger off of that change feed and build a new query for that. And we can use, a lot of these have built in the ability to do functions for materialization, but we could do it externally. And the, the beauty of this, right, you see V1, V2, V3 in history there. History is baked in. So the database will actually have all the history and the change feed will actually have the history here in this Cosmos example. Um, and then if we do these materialized views, one of the questions is what gets replicated to the data warehouse or the data lake? And the answer is it's only the primary, right? So if, unless we enrich the data, even then we don't really care about it. If all the mutations happen in one or two, collect one collection, then that's the only one that's got to go to the data warehouse. And uh, this isn't CQRS here because it's different because we actually have the entire document rather than just the event for it. And we're just gonna burn disk space by making copies. Now, the way we can fix that is we could have a couple different sub documents and those would be only only the ones if we found out there were mutation clusters and the properties we, so there's optimizations we could still do. Um, and in this case, I put this note in here to include sorting properties. In this case, it's a metadata date. So it's different than CQRS, like I said, for, for CQRS, basically we put events in the database and then the query view is materialized out of the events with the changes being applied to it. So it's got some differences. Um, basically, the mutations are stored as is, and those become an event stream fed to the query database. It also means you can't query the event stream directly for general, you know, as of point in time, whereas in the previous one, you can actually go and find the point in time just by looking at the version of the document. Again, you got to look at what the document size is to see whether this is viable and whether you do broken out documents or you do subdomains. A lot of times we have data models that are way bigger than they need to be. Um, and that tends to cause porting issues. So I would recommend that against it. So what are the query impacts of all updates being new doc? So every update is a new document instance. Every update is a new version of a document. All versions of that document have the same partition key. That means if you do multiple updates to a document, when you query based on that partition key, they meant like if that was a person, social security number, driver's license number, or basically what it means is you may end up uh, casting a wide net in your query um, on the partition key, and then you'll pull back the latest or the as of out of that collection that comes back. If we have a problem with this, we could materialize a view where we only keep the latest. So you might have the primary store be the full, and you might end up uh, with a secondary store that only kept the latest one. And then when you did an as of, you would go against the primary store. Um, and, and like I said, so if all the versions are in the primary store, you have to kind of sort these by date and get the last one. Um, and the other thing you might want to do is uh, version these so that you can figure out what order they were and if the dates weren't right, or if you did version inserts in between. Anyway, there's some complicated stuff. I'm going to be out of time. Um, and so the only other, you know, there are other things here. We're actually going to end up, unlike a relational database, V1, V2, V3 here actually might have different, slightly different schemas because they might have been installed at different times. So any consumer of this um, full history database may have to be able to consume multiple versions or we may end up having to do a version converter process or that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of times we'll do this because we end up with a zero mut mutation policy, but uh, and that's what this append is, right? No documents are ever updated, so we have a clean history. Uh, and the downside of that is sometimes we end up with data retention policies we need to work on. And what is an append only if it turns out you have to do data fixes or you have data retention, right? So delete and data fixes and immutable stores are truly problematic. Uh, so this append store only store, the primary uh, collection will or container will probably be append only, but the views may be mutable. Um, and so sometimes we have to do data fixes because of processing errors. Uh, sometimes uh, we had a business rule that's long wrong. There may be laws about forgetting data. So we may have an, an immutable store um, that we need to del delete data older than a certain amount. Now that actually, that snapshot thing works great for that. The problem with a history, an event CQRS database is if you end up trying to replay the whole thing to build everything back to rebuild your snapshots and you purged old um, events, then you actually can't create your uh, query store anymore. So you'd have to go back to some intermediate snapshot. And this approach we're taking has that intermediate snapshot for you. So you could delete old versions. Um, so we have, you know, we have a couple options about retaining immutability in the primary partition and the views implementing it. Uh, what I've seen this do here is people, this is actually kind of how some databases do to do deletes. They, 
if you're in a data lake or Cassandra or other databases, you write a tombstone record out to the database and then later on it comes back and compacts it. What that really does is we basically put down delete record, delete commands in the database and the materializations all actually delete the updates that that thing talks about. And that way in our primary store, we might end up with uh, old versions that are purged with tombstones and um, then we'd end up with the fixed uh, version, right? That was data fixed. So you might tear down V2 and V3 and insert new V2s and V3s in there. Um, and you just need to decide whether you're going to do compaction on that, which would be an option where you would basically, the only people that would have write permission to, or update permission would be the systems that have compaction permission. Anyway, uh, and so the one downside of this delete is it means if you're doing queries against the primary partition, which is append only, then it has to know the meaning of the uh, delete tombstone uh, markers. And that means you'd have to come back and, um, you know, there might be five in there and one of them has been tombstone. So you got to look at the one closest to the date that you were asking about. And really, we do this in data lakes anyway. We're going to want to send those tombstones down to our data lake because we want the materializations in the data lake to delete any records that can't be retained. And if we're going to do a tombstone fix on a write-only database where we delete an existing snapshot and then insert a snapshot, we want that to happen in the materialized views, um, in the modeled views in our data lake also. So that, and you know, this is a simple sample tombstone, uh, you know, and in this case, the tombstone sits in the primary stream and the query system could filter uh, against tombstones. So the, when you query, you would end up removing, in this case, we did a doc one V1, doc one V2, doc two V1, and doc one tombstone. That means in the materialized database, the only thing we have is document two, because document one, all versions were deleted. And so the view on the right would actually be simple to query against. If you went against the primary, you would have to know how to apply the tombstones. And so any service would have to do that. Um, so that's pretty much it. In review, the cloud storage and cloud databases have their own paradigms, and you should consider leveraging those capabilities and features when building a system, not just the lift and shift, but look at a ways to use that tools to solve problems that were difficult before. Hope that's useful. Have a great day.